uh, if you could please have a seat. Thank you. We are live, and we did fix the glitch. Okay, I'm going to figure out how to take my mask off. I'm going to go ahead and call the January Board of Commissioners meeting um, to order. Thanks everyone for attending. Uh, it's the first of our new year 2020, and hopefully it'll be better than last year with all of the pandemic issues that have caused quite a bit of disruption. Uh, we start off the new year with a number of challenges facing NRHA. We should also see these challenges and opportunities for NRHA to successfully meet those challenges. We as a board need to assure the families that we serve, that we hold NRHA, its executive director, and its leadership team to provide the highest level of service. When we fall short, we need to know why. No excuses, no passing the buck. We need to own it. We also need to know what solutions, both short and long term, that the executive director and his team will implement to address these challenges. I'm sure Ron will provide further details about this and other matters during his remarks. We also have some related items today to address in closed session. Also, Joe Dillard notified me on December 16th that he would be resigning from the board effective December 31st. During the course of our regular meeting, I will honor Joe for his years of service to NRHA and his residents. We all knew that because of his new position in Richmond, there would be some challenges for Joe to continue his service as commissioner on the NRHA board. I'd like to highlight and honor Joe's commitment and service to NRHA later in this meeting. As for a replacement for the open commissioner seat, city council will be meeting on March 8th to discuss boards and commission vacancy. <clears throat> Ron and I have been contacted by the city clerk's office for recommendations <clears throat> and the deadline to submit an application to the clerk's office is February 8th. I now invite your comments, uh, if any, on the minutes from the November 18th and December 9th board meeting. We will take them in order. So any comments on November 18th minutes? And they start on page three. I make a motion that we accept them as uh, presented. A second? A second. Ms. Carr? Mr. Albert? Aye. Mr. Gresham? Aye. Ms. Arrington? Aye. Mr. Benassi? Aye. Mr. Masaccio? Aye. Aye. Uh, Mr. Chair, for uh, for the record, that meeting, uh, one of these meetings, I wasn't present for, and that's why I, I didn't want to uh, be the voice that uh, initiated the vote. But I'm, I'm, it, that was the meeting. I am clear to accept or to vote on approval, right? I think you missed okay. the next one. The next one? Yeah, yeah. the ninth, December 9th one. You. Yeah, that's the one I missed. So I just wanted to be sure. I couldn't offer the uh, motion, uh, but I could vote to accept it. Correct. I'll do it this time. Correct. All right, and let's look at the December 9th <coughs> Board of Commissioner meeting. I have a motion. Uh, again, I make a motion that we accept them as written. Second. Uh, a second? A uh, second. Thank you. Ms. Card? Mr. Albert? Aye. Mr. Gresham? Aye. Ms. Harrington? Aye. Mr. Benanti? Abstain. I did not attend. Mr. Masek? Aye. Okay. <coughs> uh, we have <coughs> fixed the uh, technical issues, so <clears throat> we are broadcasting this meeting live on a virtual platform. Uh, all information shared today is available online in the Board of Commissioners section at uh, nrha.us. We will allow for public comment, uh, and virtual participants have the opportunity to raise their hands to comment. Attendees may also use the chat feature to make their comment as well. 
and I will uh, share these prompt instructions closer to that time. Uh, all right, uh, Mr. Jackson, okay. comments? Good morning, commissioners and, and our guests that we have with us today. I have a couple of items that I'd like to comment on, and toward the end there, I wanted to bring up some new items that I wanted to address before the board. There's a couple of follow-up items. If, if you recall, the, our uh, November 18th meeting, we had a presentation by USI People First in regards to their two-year uh, annual report. Um, can you speak up a little for me? Yeah. Uh, we had a in, excuse me, in November, at the November 18th board meeting, we had a presentation by USI People First in regards to their two-year annual report, and there were a number of statistics and things that they had presented. Uh, that information that was presented created a number of uh, questions by our board that they didn't feel that was satisfactorily answered. Uh, it was suggested that at the uh, after the end of that meeting, that the board, who, the board members who had questions, that we submit those questions in writing to USI people first. At the November, at the December board meeting, they did supply their responses, but it just so happened those responses created more questions. So I was supposed to follow up with uh, Commissioner Currier in terms of trying to set up a meeting to resolve some of the outstanding questions that the board members had. Uh, I wasn't successful in doing that. However, the, I guess the, uh, import, the related parties uh, in this matter uh, from USI and People First as well as Commissioner Purrier will be a part of the uh, Board of Commissioners HO, uh, Housing Choice Voucher Committee meeting next, I think it's next week. And hopefully in that setting, we'll be able to resolve any outstanding Question. Which committee meeting did you say? That was the Housing Choice uh, uh, Board of Commissioners Housing Choice Voucher Housing Committee okay. meeting. And I think there are members from USI or uh, People First that are at that meeting. So we hope to bring that up to be able to resolve any questions from that. All right. Yeah. Uh, only one uh, commissioner can attend because two cannot. Can two? How many uh, commissioners can attend that meeting? I think because it is a public meeting, I think there's a three. As there many, are three that attend, so it is a public meeting. As it's many a, as you wish. Yes. Okay. I want to start. Okay. The second follow-up item I wanted to uh, bring to you. Uh, at our last meeting, I think at our previous meeting in November, uh, Ray Tron, YTMC president for Granny Village, did address the board a number of items uh, that he felt that our staff needed to needed to address. Uh, at the December meeting, uh, there was a, a number of other issues that Mr. Mr. White brought before the board. Uh, Don and I felt that it was probably best if we sat down with Ray trying to go over his top five items. We did that last Friday that we met with him. Um, in your, what I'm, what I'm reading from, I think it's on page 28, 28 that I just sort of bullet pointed the items that, that we had sort of discussed, the top five items, and uh, our the five, okay, residents need to be better informed about significant events. Uh, I'm just going to briefly go over uh, needed staff positions to bridge NRHA to residents, which I think I did mention that Kim our chief of community engagement is actually working on that. We have a position that we're that's going through the approval process. It's called the community relations manager. Uh, Ron, can you speak up, please? Okay. The uh, that we are working on a, a position that Ray Tron has suggested. It's called a community relations manager. That's sort of in the, in the it's in the approval process. Um, Another item that Ray Tron mentioned was better customer service with uh, for residents. He also, uh, another item was that us, the leadership, taking care of NRHA employees, doing a better job of that, of supporting them, providing more resources to our employees. And the last thing he talked about was the development, development apartment, uh, 
apprenticeship program, mm -hmm. working uh, working with our residents, that there may be opportunities for them, or employment opportunities going through that going through a training program, that there be opportunities for them to actually be employed by NRJ. We thought those were all very good ideas, and actually, these ideas will. It's not, they're just, they're, I, would, I would say they're not just relegated to Grandview Village, but these are ideas that I think could be applied throughout all of our community. So I am meeting with staff. Uh, when I, uh, later on, one of the items that I'll talk about is our strategic planning process. These are some really good ideas that we need to start thinking about when we start thinking about NRHA moving from the old way of doing business to the new way of doing business, because we understand we can't continue to business the way that we've always done business to get different results. All right. <clears throat> Next three items I want to talk about are uh, COVID and how it's impacted our current operations. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank Richard Barcher, our HR director, for really keeping on top of how COVID has impacted us recently in terms of numbers and uh, uh, doing the tracing and exposure and numbers, because that's really been helpful for us to really get a gauge on how this current surge of COVID has impacted our operation. And unfortunately, it has. But since I started, we've been dealing with COVID in certain magnitude. And unfortunately, this last wave with the Omicron variant has really impacted our operations, primarily in the housing division. Again, unfortunately, sort of a confluence of factors in the sense that we were already dealing with staff shortages as it was, and then we have the Omicron variant that comes along. It really impacted our operations. For example, uh, just to give, put it in context, uh, as of January the 12th in Virginia, the positivity rate was nearly 36%. Uh, we weren't able to get like cumulative data, but Richard estimates that our numbers cumulatively since the onset of the Omicron variant, that it's close to that percentage of people that have been impacted in our, uh, in our agency. Uh, currently, we have, uh, we have 12 reported positive cases. And there have been 20 cases of possible exposure. So uh, hopefully we're going through the worst of it from some of the things I've been reading. The uh, projections are that <clears throat> in the next two weeks, we're going to see us start seeing a sharp decline that this, we've sort of plateaued. That's what we're hoping. And then because of the transmissibility of this particular variant, that we'll start seeing a decline, hopefully within the next uh, couple of weeks. And that's how we've been trying to keep staff encouraged and that, hey, we don't see this as being a long-term battle with this. We've re-implemented some of our mitigation strategies to try to address it, you know, like with the social distancing and masks and things like that, keeping up with the current CDC guidelines. Uh, but just try to keep the morale up and things like this. Say, hey, we need to maybe take a few steps back and go back to some of the things that we were doing in the initial part of the pandemic. But we see that you know, over the next couple of weeks or maybe a month at the, at the longest, the things will start to get back to, if you want to call it normal, because we'll probably to some degree still be dealing with it, but we can get back to, you know, to where we were before this, this onset of the Omicron. Ron, yes. Uh, what about the new strain that's come out? Delta, is there another one? <laughs> yeah, it's a new one that came out. Uh, well, the only thing I heard is about that one is that it may not be as transmissible. That's, I don't know anything about it. Yeah. But it is more variant, very real. You know, it's it's yeah. coming But I don't, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> that's the word that's <laughs> Yeah, I've heard of, you know, a combination of the COVID and flu, and I mean, there's, I don't, but we we we'll having to deal with what we what we can now. Like I said, that you know when we start doing even like talking about business operations and trying to conduct business, 
we have no idea if it's not that we're going to have to contend with for a long time. So that's really, and I'm going to get to it a little later, it's really, it's really no excuse for us to sort of sit back and say that, you know, it's going to continue, continue to impact our operations. We're just going to have to figure out a way with the balance of trying to keep people safe, but, you know, people are going to still have uh, needs and services that they require. And we're going to have to figure out a way to, to do that and be proactive in what we do under this cloud of a pandemic until we get to the point of, you know, wherever it's an end, it becomes an endemic. I think that's the term where it sort of levels off. But we just, we still got to continue to figure out ways to do it through our business. Yeah. Uh, when they do, uh, when are the, the um, services go home and the workers have to work from home, does that, it, that they don't slow down uh, the business of everything, it, or do it kind of go about the same? It it shouldn't because we went through this initially, uh, where we sort of worked through the whole thing of teleworking because we knew that there was a loss in productivity because we really weren't equipped to be able to have people telework when people were you know when we were in a state of emergency we had to send. We had to close off and send folks home, but we had we took that opportunity to make sure that people had the proper equipment. With Carl and his IT staff were able to do that, be able to have access to files. We implemented the telework policy, and one of the things we did through that was make sure that folks, for example, there was more office-oriented paperwork that they had the ability to take a look at them, get those get, uh, get those documents through electronic format. So we. We have taken steps to be able to minimize any, I would say, any any drawbacks in our work performance, even though folks had to work remote. But yes, you know, just from <clears throat> from my world, yes. um, while the uh, core activities of any operation is ongoing, yes. the the tertiary uh, conversations that may be of the creative type, a lot of that is being lost because you're dealing electronically. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. You know, again, just from my world, yeah. we're able to keep business operations going. Right. But a lot of things have sloughed off right. just by necessity because you don't yeah. have those coffee break type conversations. No. And those are those are important. I think those are the things you know when I'm thinking about. You know, just being able to go out, and go out to the office, go out, and mm -hmm. uh, even how it's impacting, you know, the, our, our housing division because there, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of face-to-face -face yeah. things that that are really part of the whole yeah. customer service experience mm -hmm. that we haven't been able to have. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that's the, that's the part that's really dropped. Uh, so that's it for the, the COVID. Uh, the next item I wanted to bring your attention is the, uh, uh, the situation that we had at, at uh, Young's Terrace, the maintenance, uh, I call it, I titled it Owning Up to Our Maintenance Failure at Young's Terrace. And I didn't, uh, and that was highlighted on uh, Wavy News uh, last week. And I certainly understand the board's frustration as well as the public's frustration, residents' frustration at me, our leadership team, and having that situation highlighted like it was, but, you know, we can't, there are no excuses. I'm not here to put forward any excuses. The only thing that I can say that we have to do a better job of what, of what we've done and the way we've done business in the past, uh, we need uh, to have short-term solutions when we have situations like that. Uh, we all understand, especially amongst the staff, that there's probably there may be more situations out there like that. Uh, like I said, that we're not offering any excuses uh, with the shortages of, that we've had with staff and then, the, like I said, with the, the surge of this Omicron variant. But it, it still goes a little deeper than that. It actually goes a little deeper in terms of the work process, the customer service. There's a lot of things that that really need to, to be addressed.
addressed in this particular situation that we need to take a, a, a really good look at. Uh, I would say in terms of the short term, uh, we're working with procurement to develop a pool of contractors to actually, to, to actually go out, in addition to our maintenance staff, to actually go out and, and try to address the problems that are there. We're combing through our work orders to make sure nothing is falling through the cracks. Uh, possibly like this situation. Are there other folks out there? You know, I've, I've actually had folks call me and say, "Hey, you know, I, you know, I put in a work order. It's been a while. No one's responded. They could have just as easily gone to Wavy Teams to But it's happened a little bit more often uh, than I feel comfortable with. It, that we have to really think about how we conduct business. So, like I said, the short term is to bring in more contractors. We're looking up, you know, Section 3 opportunities, whatever contractors that we could get to sort of deploy throughout our community to help address these kind of situations. We're dealing with buildings that are 60 years old. That, that's one problem, but that's still no excuse to not be attentive to our residents' needs. Another short, the midterm solution is, and I'm going to talk about a little bit later, when it comes to our strategic planning process, we need to look at all of our business operations. We need no stone unturned when it comes to see how we do business. Um, the long-term solution is that, like I started off saying, we're dealing with 60-year-old buildings. What is the modernization, uh, renovation, demolition going to look like? I mean, I'm talking about maybe two, three years of beyond. That, those are the long-term solutions that we really need to be able to address. But I can assure you we are working on the immediate short-term solution. That is, we're bringing in more resources, more contractors to help our staff to be able to, to respond in a more proactive way to address some of these issues that we know that Ms. Burrell and her family are probably experiencing. Like I said, I know the staff is frustrated. Donna's done a really good job in trying to reach out and stay in contact with the family. I've reached out to the family just to make sure that you know that they're that the work that we said that needed to be done is actually uh, being done. Uh, we did. We were able to find the Burrell and her family another uh, another unit in, a, in, a, in another community that was based upon uh, her you know being a the gunshot victim at the on, at the off site. Incident that happened, I think it was about a week before. Then. So we were actually able to find our new site, but still, there's a sense of urgency to make to rectify those situations, those maintenance situations that are out there. Um, Ron, yes, um, the maintenance and their uh, orders that they have, they call them into the main office, don't, but don't the main office have a responsibility? To if if a order stay there too long, they they supposed to question why this happened it's, then. Uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, that this, this the current system, and this, and this is sort of my next my next topic that I want to talk about. Uh, that the tag report, the organizational assessment, pretty much highlighted, and I and I titled it sort of in a metaphorical way. I said that we've become prisoners of our past. And basically, we have to operate with the systems. No matter how antiquated they are, we have, we have to work with those systems. You know, systems are not really modern-day systems to be able to work with to provide the excellent level of customer service. I mean, we should be at the point of where residents. We should be at the point where residents can go online. I mean, we, they go online to make rent payments. They should be able to go online and and, and submit work orders that way. Things aren't lost through cracks. There's not a phone call. Somebody writes something on a slip and it gets lost. Yes. Uh, so, so are you saying that you think the question that Rose just asked you that was a system failure? No. What I'm saying is that she was she was asking about the phone the phone that we're still folks are still calling in and no 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 the point she was making was that. That a maintenance call. Yes. If those procedures were followed, 
there was opportunity for somebody to say this has not been done. Yeah, there were. I don't think she. I don't think she was questioning the system. She was saying the management, the yeah. office management, yeah. should have known yeah. that this thing is too long. Am I right, bro? Yes. Yeah. yeah they Ma the, ma the manager. So, so I don't think that's a system failure. I think that's leadership. Yeah, that I, I would say that that's that's part that's part of it too. But I think that the system that we have in place, because like I mentioned before, I've heard it I've heard it before where things are things fall through the cracks. And it, it is leadership. I, I agree. It is it is leadership. But I think that there's ways for us to improve our response to situations like that. So yeah, it's almost like if we it should it should have been followed up on regardless of the system. I agree. Regardless of the system that's in place, there was a failure somewhere along the line at that point where the call where the person called in, mm -hmm. there was something written down and it was somewhere along the line it got lost. So that that's on that's on, you know, when I say owning that, that's we need to own it. I mean there's no excuse, but what I was talking about is that we look we can look at better ways of doing of doing this. I, I hate to uh, you know I'm I, not making excuses. Hmm? I'm not making excuses. Yeah, I hear you. But I, I, mean, I hate to uh, you know I know this is a tough time for uh, these kind of questions. I, I really right. do. But uh, Ron, I, I gotta tell you I hear you and I'm hearing what you're saying. It just seems like you're doing everything you can to not say somebody failed on this. And, and, we, I, and said, no, I, I, I said we own it. We have failed. When you say we, I said we. I said I did. Did I not say? I that heard you. The board, I heard you. That the board is frustrated. With, I did say that. I said in the beginning. I said the board is frustrated yeah. with me. I don't want to argue yeah. with you about it. I'm just simply making my comment yeah. about what, what well, I Well, this is my time. You have your you have the opportunity to okay. All right, I'll be quiet. Uh, so anyway, yes, it was a failure on our part. What I'm saying is, which I said is leads into what I'm going to say, that we've become prisoners of, of our way of, of, of old way of doing business. It's, uh, it is it was highlighted by the tag report. Now, I'm not making excuses, but what I'm saying is that the status quo is not going to work. That's basically what I'm saying. We got to figure out new ways to do things. We don't we don't have a customer service piece to service and work for. How can we follow up the residents to figure out what we did if we were satisfactory? We don't have that. Those are the things that I'm talking about that we need to have in place. We have no standards in terms of customer service. So what I'm saying is that we need to get away from the old way of doing business. There's fault around it. I have fault. I I bear it. But the reason why we did the organizational assessment is because I understood that we can't do business the way that we're doing anything. That's the bottom line. So, hey Ron. Ron, yeah. this is Ken Benassi. I yeah. clearly agree. The tag pointed this out, and you are spot on that we need a process change, and it has to do with automation. And we have right. to have an automated system where you, you and Donna Mills can look up at any one time and see, okay, we got three uh, uh, call orders that haven't been responded to in four weeks. Right. When are we going to implement this technology? Is it in the budget? And do you have a plan to implement that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. What my my last bullet? What I was talking about today was first of all, I said we're prisoners of our past, which the tag report talked about. Everybody understands that we need to change the way we do business. No one, no one uh, trying to hold up the status quo. That's why we got the report done. We know that we need to change the way we do business. Uh, I wanted to get so just to give you a sense of some of the things that we're talking about when I talk about the strategic plan. Process. Where's the mouse? 
this is just a preview. We have uh, we uh, engage uh, uh, as part of the process. We engage straight path management. They've done a, a number of uh, uh, work with a number of organizations, local organizations, private, public organizations, to come up with a strategic plan. We were to have a sort of our kickoff meeting with the strategic leadership team uh, Tuesday, but because of the issues we're dealing with COVID, we couldn't, we're actually going to have that meeting next Tuesday. But I wanted to give the board a preview, like Ken had talked about, what, what are the next steps in terms of, hey, we have the tag assessment, we know where the issues are, what are going to be the next steps? We can continue talking about the way things have been, but so we need a path forward in order to come, in order to, to take the, the next step. And just to, like I said, just to give you a preview, these are some of the things that we're going to be looking at in terms of the strategic plan. Uh, this is really the, the sort of the crux of it is right here. Goal, a new strategic plan based on high-level guidance, which is with, with, from the board. Uh, staff creation of objectives, action step measures, and timing. Why are we having it? A strategic plan is important to an organization because it provides a sense of direction and outlines measurable goals. One of the things I can say, we don't have a set of goals. There's a set of wants and here's and why are we doing this and that. One of the things I can say, if you have a whole bunch of goals, you really don't have any goals. And I, it, it brings to mind a story, uh, whether it's an anecdote or not, where if you guys have heard of Warren Buffett, the investor, he had a conversation with his pilot, and the pilot was trying to come up with his sort of his goals, his top goals. Warren Buffett said, write down 25 goals that you have for yourself that you want to accomplish. So the pilot wrote down the, the 25 goals. Uh, Warren Buffett said, I want you to circle your top five goals. So after some time, he circled his top five goals. So he said, okay, good. This is what Warren Buffett, Buffett's response was. He said, then Warren Buffett went to the pilot and he said, what are you going to do about the other 20? The pilot responded, well, when I have time, I'm going to work on them a little bit here or there. He said, no, you can't do that. Not until you accomplish your top five goals can you start working on the other. I feel like we're working on 525. There is no strategic plan that we have in place from the board, working with our staff to say these are the most important things. That's where we need to get to. And why now? After some years in reaction mode, we need to become more proactive, clarify, focus, build off of organization assessment, which is a tactical. So, like I said, this is just an overview. Some of the most important things you need to be aware of. We're actually going to start next week. Staff are going to start accumulating the data and things like that to be able to uh, sort of give you all the existing conditions of where we are in terms of our business. The next thing, which I feel is the most important part because, you know, a lot of the things that we've done recently, I don't know, you know, if you, I would say we've engaged the sort of the temperature of the public perception of NRJ. I don't know where it is at this point, given how much we've been out in the, you know, out in the public, the publicity. But I think the important part of this is that there's going to be interviews, focus groups, and surveys, not only amongst our staff and residents, but some of the thought leaders in our community. We need to know what they think of what we are doing. Now, to me, that's going to be an important step in terms of how to address and remedy the public perception that we have. We've got to sort of, we're at the point now where we've there's really nothing to hide. There's nothing to hide from me, from leadership, from the board, especially at this point. So that's going to be a very important step in the strategic planning process. In terms of actual, the board actually having to get all this information and decide with the staff help on what are the top 10, just for lack of, what are the top 10 items that we as an agency should be concentrating on? Remember, we can't concentrate on all those those other 20. We need to concentrate on the top ones that we circled and said that we need to be working. So 
that's where the board comes and say, as an agency, these are the things that we need to work on. And not only that, we need to have timetables and measures, and we need to have in our monthly reports need to show how far we're progressing with what the board says are our priorities. So, and then after that, then the, you know, the documentation of the actual report. Another, I, another part of this is that it sort of coincides with the budget process. So what that means is what's identified in the strategic plan that we provide the resource. Like Ken had mentioned, okay, there's IT, you know, when we start talking about revamping our work order system, there's going to take money to do that because this coincides with the budget process. When you all, when you present it with the, with the budget, you can say, okay, we can devote X amount of money to upgrade our work order system to make sure that, you know, we have real-time data on where we are with work order timing, when units turn, when an emergency work order starts. So that's an important, that's going to be an important uh, piece of this as well. Uh, and then the last thing, one of the questions to the question is that what are the most important issues or questions to address and resolve over the next three years? So that's what we want to be able to answer when we go through this process. So I just wanted to give you a preview. Uh, we're going to, the executive team is going to, we're going to do a lot more in-depth information and I'll keep you abreast of where we are. And once we sort of solidify the dates in terms of engaging the board, that, you know, I'll let you know so you can have on your calendar. And I'll just keep you up to date because like I said, when we start trying to reach out to the public to get their comments, that's going to be, I think that's going to be an important piece of it. And you all need to be aware that that's what we're, that's what we're doing when we start trying to get the public to take an examination of, their, of our operations as well as our staff to see that what I'm doing, what our staff is doing, are there ways to improve what we do? And that's really the only way we can change our interests. All right. Well, that's all I had. Okay, comments for the director? So again, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yes. I Not yet, no. Sir. Public comment comes a little later. Yes, sir. Sorry, Thank I you. couldn't hear you. That's all. Yeah, uh, with, with Ron, you, you are a very yeah. quiet man. So I think, yeah. Jen, next time, can we have a, a microphone? Oh, I'm still, still still hard to hear. Oh, yeah. Fair. <laughs> it's a good next go round. We'll get a microphone. Yeah, so that'll take care of everyone in the room. Yeah. Okay. It's good to be quiet sometimes. <laughs> okay, uh, commissioner's remarks? Anyone? Okay, then let's move on to the development, which is on page 30, which shows what has happened. Um, I'll give you a minute to look at those. Are there any questions about acquisitions, dispositions, all of that stuff? Uh, if not, then let's go ahead and take a look at page 32, and I'll ask Ms. Mills to uh, take over. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Can everyone hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, great. Um, so this morning you have in front of you a resolution to authorize a change order to our carbon monoxide detector installation contract. Uh, initially back in August, uh, we awarded this contract to Plessix Installation Incorporation, and this was to install carbon monoxide detectors in our communities that have gas-powered appliances. The initial award was for $99,180. Uh, after that award period, we learned that HUD was requiring these detectors to also go into any apartment unit that had uh, a gas boiler in the building, uh, which included our mid-rises, which had not been initially included in our RFP for this work. 
So we added the mid rises at a total of 373 units, which brought the contract to an additional 46,000, bringing in the total to 145,871. Um, that was below the threshold, so we made that adjustment. And then shortly thereafter, we realized that there was a miscalculation for the units needed in Oakley Forest. Uh, the initial request had 86, was which was just a building number instead of the actual unit number of four, four, excuse me, 500. And so the difference from that is 414, which had to be added to the contract as well. And that was estimated at 51,682. So as a result of that, the total change order put us over the threshold. So we are coming to you to ask for approval to award this contract in the amount of $197,472.30. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, Donna, I thought the government said they were going to do that for free. Give you free. Uh, uh, I thought the government was going to give free um, detectors. No, ma'am. We did receive funding from uh, HUD through the Capital Fund Program. We actually received one hundred and eighty thousand dollars for this specific project. So that's the funding that we're using to do this work. It's a little bit over what that amount we received. So we will use our other capital fund to do this. Okay, other questions? I mean, I think public comment later. Thank you. One of the things that's important that we get this done with the carbon monoxide one. So, uh, any other comments? Uh, if not, I'll accept the motion. So moved. Uh, a second. Second. Okay. Comments? Mr. Albert? Aye. Mr. Gresham? Aye. Ms. Harrington? Aye. Mr. Benassi? Aye. Mr. Masaccio? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, also the issues of community engagement are all in your packet as well. Uh, starting on page 33 are the contract activities reports. If there are no questions on that. I think we'll go ahead and move to the new business, which is on page 38. And it's a resolution, Mr. Jackson. Finance and administrative activity items in case there are questions. Uh, I, I said, oh, okay. Didn't, didn't, haven't heard any. So. Okay. All right. But it, it, again, if there's, it comes up later, do it. But. Okay. Uh, the next item is just a resolution um, giving the deputies or deputy direct executive directors or their designee uh, authority to be able to uh, sign the deeds or, or trans, uh, sign any deeds, declarations of trust, transfer or encumber property. That was something that was uh, vested in the executive director, but because of our organizational change and, and in order for us to continue to con, uh, conduct, biz, conduct business uh, in a timely manner, this is a resolution that's asking that the, the deputies uh, also have the, the power to be able to, to sign deeds and Encumbrance uh, declarations of trust, uh, or you know, they have the ability to designate someone so that we can continue on with that line of business without any interruption. Okay, this is what it looks like to be basically we changed some names, so we got yes. to put these names in. Yeah. Okay, uh, comments, questions? All right, and I'll uh, entertain a motion to approve. So move a second. Second. Ms. Carnes? Mr. Albert? Aye. Mr. Gresham? Aye. Ms. Arrington? Aye. Mr. Benassi? Aye. 
Mr. Musaccio. All right. Okay, and then we have the next one is resolution for Mr. Diller. It should be read. And uh, I'll go ahead and do that. Again, uh, Joe accepted a position in Richmond, and, and we knew it was going to be difficult for him to come back and forth, but uh, so he uh, resigned effective uh, December 31st, but I'll go ahead and read the resolution. Whereas Joe W. Diller Jr. has served as a member of the Board of Commissioners of the Board of the Norfolk Redevelopment Housing Authority since November 2017, whereas throughout his tenure, tenure on the board, Joe has demonstrated a strong commitment to the authority's mission of providing decent, safe, affordable housing, as well as related essential services for the citizens of Norfolk. Whereas Joe has served as an advocate for the residents of NRHA community, and a passionate voice for the equitable treatment of such residents, regardless of race, age, or economic circumstances. And whereas Joe's transportation expertise, developed through his association with Hampton Roads Transit, has brought valuable insight to the board and was instrumental in assisting the board to better recognize and address the critical need to provide access to transportation for all NRHA residents. And whereas Joe has consistently carried out his responsibility as commissioner with dedication, perseverance, and pragmatism, always serving as the voice of reason and approaching every issue with integrity and an open mind, now therefore be it resolved that we, the commissioners of the authority, do hereby take this opportunity to express our sincere appreciation for Joe's service to the authority and his many contributions to the board be it further resolved that the chairman of the board of the commissioners of the authority is hereby directed to provide a copy of this resolution to Joe W. Dillard Jr. and cause a copy of said resolution to be placed on record in the office of the authority. And I hope this is adopted this 13th day of January, 2022. And just to give you a sense of what we'll be providing Joe, uh, as, long, as well as uh, his photo from out front. So uh, with that, I'll entertain a motion to approve the resolution. So moved. So move. A second? Second. Ms. Garns? Mr. Albert? Aye. Mr. Gresham? Aye. Ms. Arrington? Aye. Mr. Benassi? Aye. Mr. Masaccio? Aye. Um, there were no committee meetings in December, so there are no um, committee meeting notes to be looked at. Uh, we will now go for the public comment before we go into uh, closed session. So uh, I will now commence the public comment portion of the agenda. Virtual participants, if you would like to state your comment, please click on the raise hand icon on your screen and you will be called upon. You can also type a comment into the question box on your screen as well. When called upon, please address the virtual room by stating your first and last name, address, and your comment. Please know that questions asked during this time may not be responded to, but instead we'll, we will make arrangements to follow up with you after the meeting to address your question. Uh, do we have folks in the room who signed up, Ms. Moore? We do. Uh, we actually have in person today, uh, starting with Mr. Rayshon White. Good morning. Um, first of all, I want to uh, uh, apologize. Again, uh, name. Oh, Rayshon White. I live 3149 E, Kimball Terrace, and it's a wonderful, uh, beautiful, uh, radiant neighborhood, Granger Village. Uh, I want to first of all say good morning to everybody and apologize the way I look. I'm going to aquatic therapy after this session. So I, my comment today is I want to do two things. I want to acknowledge when when they are good people and they're good things um, that um, that the board needs to know. Um, we had a um, I thought we had some pictures. Um, we sent some pictures to I think Jennifer for Christmas. Uh, hopefully next week you'll get to see them on the, on the screen. That um, we had lunch with Santa. The first time in almost two years, it was 
kids um, and neighbors got out to meet the new residents and to meet new kids. Um, NRHA uh, really put a big bowl on my Christmas because uh, with, with Steve Morales and Mrs. Shaw and some uh, Ms. Thomas and some other people, Donna came and Mr. Clark was there. Uh, Mr. Jekyll, thank you for the team. Um, Christmas is a big thing for us. For, uh, for me, um, it's been a big thing for all of not African American, for all the families to, to buy the birth of Christ is giving. And the agency stepped up. Um, I don't know if some of you are commissioners, but since in the pictures, we had over 100 kids in Grandy. The staff came and participated. We, I think we forgot about COVID, but we participated in giving and sharing the word of the meaning of Christmas. And that means a lot to us. Kids, I would have brought them here, but they say y'all have PS5 or um, that kind of game to live in. Now we're going to work out with us to let you tell them the way. But they were very happy about it. Um, you saw the kids outside riding their bikes and all the toys they got. And it was really a wonderful gesture. I actually had some visitors. The man Martha came and spoke. He said, to send you a letter because that's something he would like to see going forward in the city. Of doing stuff in the community that the staff was out. He saw Mr. Rose, he saw Donna said, he still said that Mr. Clark came and uh, Steve came on campus. It was just really a nice thing. So, boys, I really, we are, we have some hard things going on in the community and in, in our show, we need to some good things, but we need to honor the good things as well. Talk about the unnecessary fortunes we have in the, in the agency. So, I want to thank you for that. And the second point is, um, I talked to Pastor um, Jeffrey Gunn, Dr. Jeffrey Gunn, um, and I want to get with get to you, Mr. Jackson, first. Um, they're having the, uh, a group of people, I think it's the other hand, they're sort of certified by the Office of the Department of Health, okay. uh, boy, down and they want to go out, hopefully, what you're talking about, changing some um, rules and policies, mm -hmm. that we have a Quote, quote, and we can't tell who the resident is to get to the main job, but they're having a group of nurses, certified nurses, that want to come out and give people their shots at home. They don't have to leave them at home. I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, we have started already. I'm glad we have people that come into range today. They're giving the, the nurses that are coming out and you know going to homes and asking who needs the shot um, for the uh, coronavirus shot okay. and giving them booster shots so they don't have to leave their home. So hopefully we can adopt that to hopefully that every resident in public housing or in our chip property can get that service. Um, and we got to also also bend the rules just to make sure the residents can get the service and people know who where. And um, we actually have some of our our people on the, in our office in Grand Hills is going to walk the nurses to the house and make sure it was the right house, the right person, for the, okay. so the residents can be comfortable and the agency can be comfortable going to one house. Home. So that hopefully we can talk about that. Um, I think that'll be a good start to getting the residents because in Grand Village, ninety percent of the residents of the seniors mm -hmm. are both vaccinated and boosted. Okay. And probably about fifty, seventy percent of the residents are fully vaccinated. So um, hopefully that work, you know, um, and talking to them. So I would love to just hand them over or we have a meeting and make sure we can get to all the proper okay. people. Okay. And thank you all so much for Christmas. It was really, it was a, a blessing for the staff to even come out to do what they did. I don't know who started, where it started, let that be a legacy of um, the agency doing every year. It's really nice touch our community. And some other communities got it as well. So that's something important for you all to know. That's something that you all and I appreciate that. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, our second in-person um, speaker today is Mr. Vincent Hodges. Good morning, everybody. My name is Vincent Hodges. I live at 22 Riley Avenue, apartment number four, Norfolk, Virginia, 23507. I'm a member of the Gift neighborhood. Um, as long as we're talking about boards and commissions and ways to be effective, uh, now that some stuff that I've been doing in the political arena uh, has passed, I'd like to say that there is prime opportunity for folks to be involved with Mr. Dillard's departure. I suggest that in filling that seat, the residents are not.
not only notify, but participate in a part of very, very vocally in a part of whomever is pointed to this seat. Part of what is perceived at the doors of the neighborhoods, not only of Grandy Village with respect to Ray Charm, but in Tidewater Gardens, in Terrace, Calvert Square, Digs, Oak Leaf, right? Is that this is an area of high handed leadership. It's unacceptable that the NRHA is not immersed in places that they should be. And, sir, Mr. Albert, with respect, sir, we are all leadership. All of us in this room know and have known about what's going on in these neighborhoods for a long time, and we are all accountable to it. Mr. Jackson, I do not envy, envy you and your position to right. being the front man and the spear man on that. And I say man is a gender inclusive term. I'm a military person. Um, but there is an accountability to be passed along to the board and to us as citizens and constituents in advocating for the ethical treatment of these people who live in these neighborhoods. That is a social work perspective. That is not a political perspective. The highest level of service. These are comments that have come as I raised my, raised my hand, and I apologize for the interruption. That no, I'm no, uh, mm -hmm. Disruptive, but I'm new to this, this board and, and the proceedings here. So I will make sure that in, in the future, I will make sure that public comments or these comments come at the end, and I won't be disrupted. But I will make sure that I take, try to take the time to take notes to address things that are said. Highest level of customer service. Why? Because these are human beings that live here. We need to own it, right? Mr. Jackson, I want to applaud you. I did some time um, working as an organizer with, with Planned Parenthood, who has a checkered past in minority communities. Regarding their troubled past and their checkered past, they have a policy of admit and admonish. We are a victim of our past as a city with a legacy of how we've treated these citizens. We need to admit where we are wrong, where we have been wrong, all the way back to Kent, further, all the way back to the annexation in the Berkeley neighborhood and the intentional burning out of residents in that community. We need to admit these things and admonish them. And it will require us to enter spaces of fragility where there will be hard feelings, but work will get done if we are honest with these constituents. Strong, again, I strongly encourage whomever is going to be placed in Mr. Dillard's seat have strong, verifiable ties to this community. They do not want any more high-handed leadership. We and other community organizers, per your request, sir, will be taking the, your word in the street about this vacancy, and we'll, we'll be advising the, dead, the deadline for these applications is February 8th. We will be putting that into the streets. Please assist residents with advocating for themselves in this process. Um, thank you for uh, and, uh, letting us know, sir, about the NRHA uh, uh, meeting and these being broadcast live. Technology is an issue for the constituent base in, in which you are dealing. Some of these people don't even know how to text from their phone. So to expect them to come in and advocate for themselves via a website with inter spotty internet is unacceptable. The NRHA can do a better job by bringing this information to the doors of constituents. Okay. Uh, let's see. We don't know what happened to the December meeting. There are us that work in the communities that knock on doors that advocate on behalf of you to say, hey, this is where boards and commissioners sit. We come to speak with you and meet you where you are in the administration and advocacy process. When we don't get word that meetings change in a fair, equitable, and timely manner, not only does the process from the NRHA look poorly, but us trying to assist you as community advocates and advocating on their behalf look poorly. Our reputation and our ability to come alongside and assist for the ethical treatment of these human beings is eroded by poor planning. It is unacceptable. Please, from now on, if meetings are going to be changed, they should be known in a timely manner. These residents deserve that. They are working two or three jobs. They have real barriers and real issues that must be admitted. When you do quick 90-degree pivots on times and meetings, it is not fair to them. Fairness and equitable, treat, equitable treatment of these citizens should be first. Social work perspective, not political. That line of communication was horrible. Okay, this neglect of this, these communities is violence. And as a social worker, I will, I will advocate for these citizens in that way. If we keep information from them, we are deliberately mistreating them. It is unacceptable. Uh, 
I hear about the top five, right? And I'd like to hear the top five from every community that it falls under the NRHA, not just the top five for the plot as a whole. These are different communities in different parts of the city. The needs are different. The needs of the citizens that remain in Tidewater Gardens as the redevelopment continues is different, obviously, than the needs of the Grandy neighborhood, which I was in as most recently as Tuesday evening. It's not the same. Their needs are different. I believe in what Mr. Uh, what we're talking about as far as community relation man managers in each of the communities. I think that that's a fantastic idea, but we need to distill that down further. And we need to see if there's an opportunity to empower these citizens by using something that may be as simple as the sign and block capital. We have people that live right next to each other and due to violence, poverty, and other disenfranchising moves that have been taken on behalf of the city will not talk to each other. They are separated by cement and a firewall. And they won't speak to each other because of mistrust that has been bred here in this process, not by you individually, just by this process. Block captain suggested, I'd love to talk with you about that. The Delta Crown variant is the most recent variant of the, of the Delta virus. Right now, it is the best of both worlds as I interrupted and it again apologetically say so. It is more virulent than the Delta, than um, the Omicron variant, which means that people will get sicker. That is less contagious than Omicron. So it is still out there and it's still a threat. We have to reach these people with proper PPE in place, and we have to make sure that if we're forcing them to do things like double moves, stuff like that, where they will be compromising their immuno safety measures, that we protect them. Going and going on Amazon and spending forty dollars on a bag of M95 masks might be easy for us. It is impossible for them asking them to pay for moves in advance because some of them are still unclear about the process where they're being double moved out of Tidewater Garden. Some of them can't afford that. They can't go get a signature loan in advance and they don't know the process to receive their money in advance, let alone pee. That's a crime, sorry. I, it's just important in this, please, with respect to the board, I don't mean to loud talk to you all, but please remember that this large constituency space here that we're talking about is a minority and so an economically developing population. There is statistical data from a social work perspective that shows that the effects of what's happening during the pandemic are affecting these communities at three times the rate. And we're talking about what was their pre-pandemic levels. Birth rates of black women, violence, poverty. We have to act fast and in, in the spirit of good faith. I heard about creative types and creating that, you know, um, I think that in working with that, sir, I think that there's, a, I, Mr. Gresham was talking about creative types. I think that there's an opportunity to bridge that, but there needs to be some awareness. There's only a simple street that crosses the Neon District, which is a high revenue drive for the city, right? And what's happening right next door with their neighbors? So those creative types can be put to work. Contractors, RFIs, maintenance staff. I get it. Work orders, ma'am. Too many, too many residents that we go to week by week by week say, I don't know what's happening. I put a, a trouble call for a bullet hole in my window. And I don't have a trouble call number, and I don't know when they're going to come out. They just say, yeah, we're going to get it fixed. I have many allies alongside that have come along with me in this process that have met one particular tenant who's had a bullet hole in their window for, for the better part of a year. Now, what I can tell you is that just in a regular inspection of those homes by maintenance personnel, it's just human decency, upkeep, maintenance, policing, somebody should have fixed it. It's not fit. And that's prevalent throughout these communities. They need a trouble call number. If they call into a maintenance per personnel, okay, it's today's date, and you're the first person to call with a trouble call number. Easy. These solutions that, that we're talking about here, simple solutions, sir, and the board, respectfully, I'm a retired sailor. We can, and you can create an Excel spreadsheet and put ticklers on the blocks. Hey, remind, some, remind us in two weeks to call this person if nobody's followed up. There are solutions here. We don't want to provide an excellent level of customer service right now. Short term, let's provide a basic level of customer service. I implore the board to do that. 
complete because I have pictures on my phone of people living in mold right now, of people turning on their faucets and, and, and debris coming out of their spigot. Is it a, a, a broken, rotted out, rotted out, you know, dry rotted valve? Could be. These buildings are 60 years old, but are they supposed to know that? Not their responsibility. The tenants. This is where we come in and advocate for them. Well, thank you very much for your passion. Is, your passion is clear, and I think you've hit on a number of things that uh, Ron has talked about, and we will be engaging with folks uh, to make sure that there is an understanding of what's happening. Thank, thank you, you very much, and I'm happy to leave you my information. Okay. So thank you Please for the work. Okay. Thank you.
Donna Mills, she doesn't do her job. There's a lot of stuff going on that we know is going on. It shouldn't have to take a woman getting shot in the face for maintenance to fix the issues. Y'all hitting her up. Hey, I'll contact her. Hey, I'll contact her, et cetera, et cetera. None of that would never have happened. The way we teach each other, they can interview her for her getting shot in the face. And then it's, oh, we got these maintenance problems. We've been, we've been talking about these problems. We've been submitting photos. Y'all know what's going on. The, 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 the people that y'all hire for the maintenance issues can't even fix maintenance issues. They can't even like change the light bulb. Whatever problem that they have, they say, oh, we've got to um, contact the contractor. So what's the point of having maintenance staff if nobody knows what they're doing? So y'all need to go back to the drawing board with that to hire some people that's actually going to do the job and then if there's a job that they can't do that's too big for them to do, then you get the contract with them. Um, they're charging people for trash on the property. It's horrible. Um, they're charging people for, for lights, uh, light bulbs, and uh, screen fix, telling people to come out of their pockets for things that y'all are supposed to replace with y'all own. Um, I've been following y'all for about two years. Um, I kind of know everybody's faces in here, and names, and everybody that's on the call, but I just wanted to do my research just in case. Um, I got about like six months, maybe seven months worth of material evidence of um, intentional neglect and a lot of corruption going on. So it's not like we don't see what y'all doing. We see what y'all doing, and we want it done, or we will take out the action if it's necessary. Nobody wants to do that. I want the people to get their fair share and get treated with some dignity. Y'all act like they're not human beings just because they live on y'all property, which is a uh, below the status quo. Um, Mr. Jackson um, presented a, a six month plan about what needs to be said, what needs to be done. You don't need six months for that. Y'all know what's going on. Get it rolling like right now. Get it rolling this week. You don't need no retreat to know what's going on. You just can go to the doors or ask anybody. You can add Don, you can add any, you can add any, any manager that's in Calvary Square, that's in Young's Park, that's in Diddy's, et cetera, et cetera, what's going on. Y'all know what's going on. Y'all need to stop playing these games. Um, people first, trash. These, uh, people that y'all look for, these civic leads, uh, uh, head people that y'all bridge get, is trash. Everybody want to kiss up and just say all this, but nobody want to do the work. You got people that's, that's, have these vouchers that's not getting accepted otherwhere uh, in other places. Um, you got limits on the vouchers. Um, you got people being displaced, getting back in places that y'all kicked them out of. You got, you got, you got. Of course, you got crime. You got policing. You got, you got. Make, uh, you have certain people in certain offices overcharging people, and they shouldn't be. It's receipts out here. It's 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 a lot of a lot of wild stuff going on. And I know y'all know half of what's going on. That's not saying nothing. Or maybe y'all think I can just get away with everything. But I'm just here to tell y'all that y'all need to tighten up and do what y'all supposed to do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Moore, do we have anybody online? We have no additional callers on the line, and we have checked the lobby, and there is no one in the lobby. All right, and I will close the public comment period. Thanks, folks, for speaking. I did have I did have one item I wanted to announce before we went into closed session. Okay. All right. Before we go into closed session, Mr. Jackson. Yes, I was. Uh, I just wanted to let the board know that I was invited to be a part of uh, Chief Boone's uh, press conference that he is set for tomorrow at 12:30 at the uh, uh, Police Administration Building. Uh, there's going to be uh, his uh, uh, community partners as well as the uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms will be there as well, and they'll be talking uh, talking about guns, youth violence and straw gun purchases. And that's, again, that's tomorrow. It's a press conference tomorrow with, his, with the NPD's community partners. It's 1230 tomorrow at the police administration building. Okay. Okay, thank you. 
Um, we will now take a look at going into closed session. January 13, 2022. Be it resolved that the authority will convene in a closed meeting pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act as amended, the Act, to discuss the following matters which are specifically exempted from public disclosure by the code section referred to below. Personnel matters involving the assignment, promotion, appointment, demotion, performance, salaries, or resignation of employees of the authority as authorized by section 2.2-3711A1 of the Act, and consultation with the authority's legal counsel regarding probable or actual litigation requiring the provision of legal advice by counsel as authorized by section 2.2-3711A7 of the Act. Now I have a motion, please. Second. Mr. Albert? Aye. Mr. Gresham? Aye. Ms. Harrington? Aye. Mr. Benassi? Aye. Ms. Perrier? Aye. Mr. Musaccio? Aye. All right, with that, we normally take about five minutes reminding you not to discuss any business whatsoever. Uh, so okay. we'll reconvene shortly. All right.
Ken Benassi. Good morning, this is Delphine. I'm calling you on the separate line so that please mute yourself on the computer.
that was good. Okay. Resolution convening, uh, I'm sorry, resolution certifying a closed meeting. We lost Ken Benassi. Should I call him back? Go ahead. Did the line drop? Are you back? Yes, okay. Whereas the authority has convened a closed meeting on this day pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas section 2.2-3712D of the 1950 Code of Virginia, as amended, requires a certification by this authority that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, upon motion duly made and seconded, be it resolved that the authority hereby certifies that to the best of each commissioner's knowledge, number one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed meeting, and number two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the authority. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Mr. Gresham? Aye. Ms. Arrington? Aye. Mr. Benassi? Aye. Ms. Perrier? Aye. Mr. Masaccio? Aye. Do we have uh, further comments? This has been fun. <laughs> it's been real, it's been fun, but it hasn't been real. Fun. Yeah. All right. And I will call the January meeting to a close. Thank you, everyone. Thank All right. you.